بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم با سلام My name is Zahra Jalalian and my presentation is about autonomous task scheduling in fast big data processing. First of all, I'm going to have an introduction for the fast big data processing. As you know, big data characteristics uh, consist of four Vs like volume, var uh, variety, velocity, and veracity. For big data processing, we have to um, cut big data to the small subsets of data and uh, distribute them to the several compute nodes for parallel processing. Uh, data has two kinds of lifetime, like short and long. For uh, short lifetime processing, we have to use real-time processing. And for the long, we can use both real-time and <coughs> batch processing. Batch processing, we have, to, you, uh, we have to store data and then using distributed batch processing. And for real-time processing, we have to use distributed real-time processing and then store the data. Um, now I'm going to talk about problems in the fast uh, big data processing. Uh, some data are produced in high speed and lose their value quickly. So we have to uh, analyze them in real time for decision making and then store the data. Fast big data processing means data production rate must be uh, approximately near to data processing rate. Uh, now I'm going to talk about challenges in the fast big data processing. First of all, I want to show the architecture of the big data processing framework. In this framework, there are um, different applications um, and each application uh, are divided to a, a set of tasks, and tasks uh, must be distributed to the several compute nodes for parallel processing. First challenge is what is the task's res uh, resources requirements, like CPU time, memory size, I.O. size, or internet si time? Uh, the next challenge is uh, how to select an appropriate compute node to execute tasks in a cluster. Task required uh, resources must be uh, approximately near to compute nodes available resources. Sorry. If uh, the number of tasks uh, are much more than the number of compute nodes in the system, we have to group uh, tasks to be executed in the same compute node. But how, can I, uh, how we can uh, do that? Uh, for uh, sending tasks uh, to compute nodes, we have to know the current state of all compute node resources for receiving further tasks. Um, for fault tolerance, we have to uh, make sure uh, to provide continuous uh, correct performance of task in case of failures. Uh, we have to uh, make sure that all resources in a compute node have to be, uh, are to be busy most of the time. For the compute node's load balancing, uh, we have to uh, make sure that all compute nodes um, have the same number of tasks running on them or waiting for services. Now I'm going to introduce the proposed framework. Uh, and first, um, I'm going to show the architecture of the autonomous task scheduling. In this uh, 
architecture, there is a layer named SPARC. SPARC Resilient uh, Distributed Data Sets is a fast and general engine for larger scale data processing and it provides uh, coarse grained resource sharing and data is um, resident in cache or RAM for fast processing. Uh, coarse grained sharing resources systems consist of few but large components versus, uh, versus in fine uh, grained sharing resources systems uh, consist of many but small components and provides more availability and better fault tolerating. Uh, in the uh, uh, proposed framework, there is a part named as Mesos, which is a cluster manager uh, with distributed two-level scheduling mechanism and um, it supports um, fine-grained resource sharing. Um, in the architecture, each compute node has a, compute, a component named as a controller the controller uh, controls uh, executors and task queue. And after uh, task execution, controller send a report regarding the task resources consumption to the uh, scheduler. And also, uh, controller send the current uh, status of the component of the compute nodes resources to the uh, scheduler. This is an example of the uh, report which uh, is sent from the compute node to the history log uh, regarding tasks resource consumption. Uh, in uh, the proposed framework, uh, all serial tasks are sent to the uh, same compute node for processing and parallel tasks are sent to different compute node for parallel processing and fast processing. Uh, here there is a, a table uh, as an example for the declare model of task resources requirements and relationship. As you see, there is a parallel tasks uh, part and serial tasks uh, which shows uh, which tasks are parallel and serial to the current tasks and the resource consumption uh, of these tasks. Um, this table is an example of the current compute nodes status report uh, which is sent from the compute node to the uh, scheduler. Uh, in the uh, proposed framework, whenever the number of tasks are much less than the number of compute nodes, then uh, some cluster uh, will be inactive. And also, whenever the number of tasks are much more than the number of compute nodes, then more clusters will be used. As you see in this picture, autonomous task scheduler receives a different tasks from different applications. And then by using task resources needed and relations declare model, and also current status of compute nodes resources, um, it choose a compute node for uh, task allocation. Task allocation. Um, this autonomous uh, scheduler is dynamic and heuristic. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. If there's any question, no question. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to invite uh, Mr. Abdi his presentation. The title is a new approach to our grid provisions.
من تنه میتونم بذارم اینجا مندس چارنگوش تا میکروفون شکم بالا تنه بیاد هم Good morning. In this work, a new approach towards grid provisioning. Our main interest is in the grid technology, infrastructure, and its architecture. Grid computing can be defined as technologies and infrastructures. Uh, supporting and sh supporting the sharing and coordinated use of diverse resources in dynamic distributed virtual organization. A virtual organization is a dynamic collection of individuals, institutions, and resources. The ultimate goal of the grid is to enable diverse, distant, distrustful organizations to share their resources. For example, enabling a scientist to access a database from another country in a different administrative domain. Resource sharing is uh, quite necessary and inevit inevitable in today's world. The very first reason is uh, economic. Uh, for example, supercomputers are very expensive. And second, certain resources like uh, special databases or even people cannot be replicated. The grid architecture follows the principles of the hourglass model. The, layer, uh, the fabric layer provides access to resources made available by the grid infrastructure. The neck of the hourglass consists of resource and connectivity protocols, which facilitate the sharing of individual resources. The collective layer in, involves the coordinated or collective use of multiple resources and consist of protocols and services that capture interactions across collection of resources. The final layer application consists of user applications operating within the wheels or virtual organizations. Here we describe a number of grid architecture's shortcomings. First, the layers communication. The components within each layer share common characteristics but can build on capabilities and behaviors provided by any lower layer. The application layer is able to communicate with three layers, as we saw in the previous slide. The application layer is able to communicate with three layers di directly. Uh, connectivity resource and the uh, collective layer. This makes the system significantly more complex from the viewpoint of an application developer. A layer works best if it only requests services from the layer below it, and uh, as we have already seen it in the uh, open systems interconnection or ESO OSI model. The grid architecture is first and foremost a protocol architecture. Are protocols more important than the components themselves? Protocols only govern the interactions between components. And second in our list is systems interconnection. This architecture does not provide a unified point of view for systems interconnection. The third is entity addressing. The grid architecture does not support addressing by nature. Would it not be easier to locate entities if we had an inherent addressing mechanism provided by the architecture itself? Another problem is related to applications and resources. It is assumed that an application requests a resource, but they are not of the same type. We prefer to have only peer layers talk to each other. Uh, and sometimes it is not the resource, but the computing element which is controlling that resource that we can communicate with. For example, we may not uh, be allowed to have direct access to a special microscope, but we are definitely able to have another computer do the job for us. The last item on our list is security. It has been claimed that secure access to resources is provided by applying secure protocols. Clearly, this is not enough because a protocol is only a means to communicate. In this work, we try to... In this work, we try to, 
In this work, we try to present a new architecture for the grid infrastructure. I'm sorry. In this, in this work, we try to present a new architecture for the grid infrastructure using the lessons that we have learned from the web. The question here is that can we use the concepts of the World Wide Web to our advantage here? That remains to be seen. The new architecture is based on the structure of the ESO OSI model. First of all, a grid is a distributed system. A distributed system is a collection of autonomous computing elements that appears to its users as a single coherent system. Let us think of the grid as a network of computing elements which have access to certain resources. And we need to make these resources available to the users, for example, scientists. We call each of these computing elements a host. This host can be a mobile device, a PC, workstation, etc. Suppose that each host has a, has a running application and each, of, and each application is composed of well-defined lightweight services. Each of these lightweight services does only a single operation and therefore has only one interface. Each service has access to local resources like databases, etc. When an application requests the resource, it communicates with another application on another host in any part of the infrastructure. Uh, it means uh, other organizations or even other virtual organizations. So as you can see, this is our vision and our goal. This is a glimpse of the vision. An application on a host in any part of the world needs to use a special microscope. It sends the request to a special host called Gateway. Then the gateway forwards the request to the destination gateway through wide area network. There the request is handed to the application in the destination host and depending on the requested lightweight service, the operation can be done. As a simple point of view, we can see that uh, there are seven layers that facilitate such an infrastructure. From, uh, this is the new uh, approach uh, from the bottom, uh, the network interface, which provides access to network, for example, wide area network and carries the messages. The contact layer, which identifies the source and destination hosts. The, the chain layer, this, uh, this layer can identify source and destination organizations because we know that the virtual organizations are collection of smaller organizations. The shipping layer is intended to, to be used for possible interconnection between virtual organizations. As we know, this is not possible right now. Resource layer des describes the required resource and, for example, just uh, how exactly are we going to use the resource or something like that. The service layer identifies the those lightweight services in each application that we talked about, the source and destination services. And finally, the application layer describes uh, or identifies the source and destination applications. In fact, we have we try to solve the problem of the peer layers not talking to each other with this approach. So now applications can talk to each other instead of applications re requesting for resources like that. And that is it. Thank you. Any question? A question? Thank you. I'm going to invite Mr. McNamee to present this presentation. <coughs> Thank you. 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 Thank you.
مرسی جناب دکتر سلام عرض میکنم خدمت همه موضوع ارائه من در زمینه انتخاب ویو ها توی دیتا ورهاوس هست با استفاده از الگوریتم ژنتیک ابتدای تعریفی از دیتا ورهاوس ارائه میکنیم بعد کار و اینکه چرا از جی ای استفاده کردیم و توضیح میدیم بعد کارهای مرتبطی که در این زمینه انجام شده رو یه بررسی کوتاهی انجام میدیم روشون بعد راکار پیشنهادیمون رو میدیم در انتها هم یک جنبندی از موضوع خواهیم داشت و کارهایی که میشه در این زمینه انجام بشه رو مطرح میکنیم به منظور نگهداری اطلاعات مربوط به منابع ناهمگین از دیتا ورهاوس استفاده میکنم معماریش هم همونجور که در شکل میبینید به شکل استار نشون داده میشه و از مواردی که دیتا ورهاوس استفاده میشه میشه به اجرای کوئری سخت و سنگین و پیچیده اشاره کرد و همچنین تجزیه و تحلیل و آنالیز اطلاعات اما خود دیتا ورهاوس یه سری مشکلات داره یعنی یه سری دغدغه ها داره که از اون موارد میشه به هزینه نگهداری دیتا ورهاوس اشاره کرد و همچنین درک دقیق آنالیز هاش چون به هر حال میزان اطلاعات حجم اطلاعات بالاست به همین دلیل درک دقیق اطلاعات سنگینه آنالیز کردنشون سنگینه و یکی از مهمترین مسائلی که با توجه به حجم بالای اطلاعات توی دیتا ورهاوس مورد بررسی و دغدغه هستش مسئله کارایی دیتا ورهاوس است یکی از مسائلی که باعث افزایش کارهای دیتا ورهاوس میشه ویوهای پیاده سازی شده هستند ویوها کلا یک شی از دیتابیس هستند که نتایج مربوط به کوئری رو نگهداری میکنن تو خودشون که باعث ساده سازی جداول میشه باعث افزایش سرعت میشه و با توجه به خاصیت ایندکسینگی که داره سرعت جستجو رو بالاتر میبره و یک مثل کش عمل میکنه و یک کپی از اطلاعات رو در اختیار کاربر قرار میده اما ما چرا از الگوریتم ژنتیک استفاده کردیم خب برای مسائلی که فضاهای جستجوی بزرگی دارند و همچنین مسائل ام پی الگوریتم‌های اکتشافی خب بهترین گزینه هستند توی بحث الگوریتم اکتشافی باز اگر جیه به خوبی پیکروندی بشه نسبت حالا به گریدی که تو ماکسیمم مینیمم محلی احتمال داره گیر کنه به دلیل خاصیت میوتیشنی که داره این احتمال توی جی کمتره و همچنین حالا نسبت به الگوریتم کلونی سرعت همگرایی بالاتری نسبت به اونها داره برای همین ما از الگوریتم ژنتیک استفاده کردیم اما آقای لیژانجو و همکارانشون الگوریتم ژنتیک را دادن در همین زمینه که فقط روی جامعیت ویو فکوس کرده بودن و روی اون کار میکردن آقای لیانگ و همکارانشون الگوریتم اکتشافی دو مرحله ای ارائه داده بودند یعنی در مرحله اول اومدن ست هایی رو انتخاب کردن از ویو ها که روی ریسپونس تایمشون بهین سازی رو انجام داده بودند بعد از ویو های انتخاب شده بحث مینتیننس کاست رو مورد بررسی قرار دادن و آقای کمار و همکارانشون الگوریتم زنبور اصلی ارائه دادن که روی ریسپونس تایم کار کردند و یکی از مواردی که خیلی روش مانور میدادن این بود که شبکهشون قابل گسترشی یعنی با بالا رفتن حجم اطلاعات شبکهشون گسترش پیدا میکنه و میتونه جواب بهینه رو بهشون بده اما هدفمون توی ارائه این مقاله مجموعه از ویوها رو میخوام انتخاب کنیم که برای پیاده سازی یعنی بتونیم ویوهای انتخاب کنیم که بهترین جواب به ما بده اما پارامترهایی که در این زمینه انتخاب کردیم چیان سایز خب هنوز هم با توجه به رشد اطلاعات و بحث فناوری ارتباطات هنوز هم مسئله سایز یه مسئله به عنوان دغدغه هست و مکان‌های ذخیره سازی و فضای ذخیره سازی یک دغدغه محسوب میشن جامعیت ویوها چیه ما میگیم که وقتی که ویویی که انتخاب میشه هر چه تعداد زی مجموعه های اون ویو انتخاب شده بیشتر باشه یعنی به کاربرهای بیشتر جوابگو هست و این میتونه برای ما بهینه باشه ریسپونس تایم یا همون زمان پاسخگویی مهمترین پارامتر در کلن سایت هست یعنی کاربر منتظر این نمیشه که بخواد اطلاعات بازیابی بشه از دیتا ورهاوس هر چی این زمان کمتر باشه برای ما بهینه تر هست مینتیننس کاست سمت مقابل هست یعنی طرف سرور هست و شرکت هایی که ارائه دهنده خدمات هستن که این میزان هم باید کمتر باشه و تعداد تکرارها توی یک بازه زمانی برای یک ویو درخواستی ارائه میشه تعداد درخواست ارائه میشه که هرچی این تعداد بیشتر باشه به احتمال بالاتری ویوی که انتخاب شده توی مرحله بعدی مورد درخواست قرار میگیره اما یک اسکیمای کلی از موضوع ارائه میدیم توی یک بازه زمانی میاد 
ویو هایی که ساخته شده به الگوریتم ارسال میشه الگوریتم با توجه به حجم ارسال دریافت اطلاعاتی که داره تعدادی از ویو ها رو انتخاب میکنه به ان وی مون ارسال میکنه بعد سرور که اطلاعات از کاربر دریافت میکنه درخواست از کاربر دریافت میشه ابتدا به ان وی متصل میشه اگر اطلاعات اونجا بود بازیابی میکنه و به مرحله بروزستانی انجام میشه در صورتی که نبود کوئری درخواست داده میشه به دیتا ورهوس و از اونجا بازیابی میشه اما گفتیم مهمترین بخش الگوریتم ژنتیک مسئله پیکروندیشه ما برای جمعیت اولیه همون به صورت رندوم کروموزوم ها انتخاب میشن و از ریل نامبر و از برای انکود از ریل نامبر استفاده میکنیم کلا دو مدل داریم یکی باینری کد یکی هم به صورت ریل نامبر باینری با توجه به اینکه حجم کروموزوم ها رو افزایش میده باعث میشه که سرعت اجرای الگوریتم کمتر کنه برای مسئله انتخاب یا عملگر انتخاب هم از الیتیسم استفاده میکنیم که کروموزوم هایی که بهینه تر هستند برای تولید فرزندان انتخاب بشن و در عملگر کراس اوور هم هم از سینگل پوینت استفاده می کنیم هم از مالتی پوینت و به احتمال 9 دهم ده روی کروموزوم این عملگر اعمال میشه عملگر میوتیشن هم که گفتیم برای جلوگیری از گیر کردن در ماکسیمم مینیمم محلی هست به احتمال 1 صدام روی پارام... روی کروموزوم ها اعمال میشه تا از گیر کردن جلوگیری کنه اما مهمترین بخش قضیه توی الگوریتم های ژنتیک مسئله فیتنس فانکشن هست توی الگوریتمی که ارائه شده بود اکثرا یه تابع پنالتی در نظر گرفته بودن که این توابع باعث می شدن که زمان اجرای الگوریتم اون بالاتر بره ارائه یک ال... یک تابع کارا با پیچیدگی کمتر به خاطر اینکه روی تمامی کروموزوم ها میزان شایستگی اعمال میشه میشد سرعت اجرای الگوریتم رو بالاتر ببره توی اینجا ما پارامتر مینتننس کاست رو به عنوان پارامتر پنالتی در نظر گرفتیم که در صورت که میزان هزینه نگهداری بالا باشه همین باعث میشه که حتی اگر پارامتر بقیه هم بهینه باشن باز هم میزان فیتنس فانکشن بالاتر بره در الگوریتم ما میزان بهینگی در کمینه بودن میزان فیتنس فانکشن هست اما من یه دونه روی یه دیتا ورهاسی که پیاده سازی کردم نمودارش رو در آوردم که خب با توجه به کمینه با توجه به کمینه بودن میزان فیتنس فانکشن که برای ما بهینه بودن رو ثابت میکنه نزولی بودن نمودارمون نشان دهنده پیکر بندی و کانفیگور مناسب الگوریتممون هست و نقاطی هم که به شکل پیک داریم مشاهده میکنیم نقاطی هست که جهش روش انجام میشه اما وقتی من الگوریتم رو اعمال کردم گفتم ببینم که دقیقا ویوهایی که انتخاب شده آیا ویوهای مناسبی هست یا نه نمودار سمت راستش تعداد انتخاب های هر ویو رو نشون میده که من یه بخشیش رو انتخاب کردم و ویوهایی که تعداد انتخاب بالاتری دارن ویوهایی هستن که اللحاظ فیتنس فانکشن مناسب هستن و برای پیاده سازی به درد ما میخورن اما مسئله بعدی که در این زمینه وجود داره بحث سرعت اجرای الگوریتم است که روی 25 دیتا ورهوس اطلاعات دیتابیسی که داشتم دیتا ورهاوسی که داشتم اینو پیاده کردم که خب با توجه به زمان با توجه به تجهیزات سخت افزاری که در دسترس بود و ازشون استفاده کردم زمان اجرا الگوریتم به شدت مناسب بود این هم به دلیل همون عدم استفاده از توابع سربار توی الگوریتممون بود اما هدفمون چی بود و یه جنبندی هم موضوع داشته باشیم ما میخواستیم ویو انتخاب کنیم مجموعی از ویوها رو انتخاب کنیم برای پیاده سازی این کار رو با چی انجام دادیم با الگوریتم ژنتیک انجام دادیم و پارامترایی که میخواستیم روشون کار کنیم سایز بود جامعیت ویو بود زمان پاسخگویی بود هزینه نگهداری تعداد تکرار تعداد تکرارهایی که از هر ویو توی سیستم نگهداری میشه و آخرین مسئله هم که به عنوان پارامتر سایه بود ما اکسیکیوشن تایم زمان اجرای الگوریتم رو مورد بررسی قرار دادیم و در انتها هم کاری که کارهایی که میشه در این زمینه انجام بشه خب گفتیم فضای جستجو و فضای دیتا ورهاوس گسترده هست و ارسال تمام اطلاعات به الگوریتم ژنتیک باعث میشه که زمان اجرامون بالاتر بره ما میتونیم از ابزارهای کلاسیفای استفاده کنیم ویوها رو دسته بندی کنیم و ویوهایی که توی در کلاس های با رتبه بالاتری هستن ارسال کنیم به الگوریتم که همین باعث افزایش سرعت اجرای الگوریتم میشه اگه سوالی هست من در خدمتتون هستم
Hello, my name is Tarane Ruth Pema. First, let me express my deepest gratitude for addressing me to this valuable Congress and such uh, audience. Uh, our uh, presentation aims to uh, um, introduce the help of data mining to the one of the most uh, costly uh, industry uh, mining in the world. Uh, so we are uh, investigating geochemically of Sangon iron ore reserve by applying SGS uh, algorithm. Uh, applied uh, geochemistry is the science uses uh, the tools and principles of chemistry to many, uh, explain mechanisms uh, behind uh, geological systems and underground. Uh, the prosperity of our society and the standard, uh, standard of living are directly uh, related to our ability to find, uh, exploit, and uh, manage uh, mineral and me metal resources. Metal and mineral resources uh, or uh, geochemical uh, anomalies and uh, applied geochemistry uh, plays a critical role uh, throughout the mineral resources uh, value chain from early stage uh, exploration to mine uh, closure. Uh, so uh, we are uh, using data mining, uh, the practice of examining large pre-existing data set uh, in order to generate new information. Uh, Generally, data mining um, is the process of analyzing data uh, from different perspectives and change it uh, into um, new information, uh, which uh, is used uh, to which is used uh, to increase a revenue cut uh, uh, costs uh, or both. Uh, so, uh, those statistics uh, uh, which are used uh, is a branch of a statistic, uh, statistics focusing on special uh, data sets. Uh, statistics, uh, the application of the statistical uh, methods to all uh, resources uh, challenges has been significant because uh, it uh, should make it uh, possible to rectify uh, problems uh, associated with uh, estimating grades. So, uh, but uh, statistics, uh, uh, its own, uh, doesn't uh, consider the each sample uh, related to the other sample. So, uh, those statistics. Uh, mm, comes uh, because it uh, can uh, mm, uh, consider each sample uh, dependent to uh, one another uh, due to its location. Uh, about Sangon Iron Mine, uh, which is located at the eastern of Iran uh, near the uh, Afghanistan boundary, uh, Sangon is known as a world-class uh, iron scarn deposit with, uh, with a proven resource of over uh, 1,000 million ton iron uh, and as one of the most uh, important mines due to containing a, a high uh, grade of iron and uh, of course a very low grade of uh, phosphor because uh, it, uh, it, this element is uh, directly related uh, to a uh, weakened uh, uh, quality of iron. Uh, so, uh, first and foremost, uh, indisputably, we should uh, do uh, pre preparation and uh, the statistical um, parameters uh, for three variables, Fe, FeO, and the sulfur, uh, have been uh, achieved and uh, detecting all. Uh, out layers and uh, distributions and normalizing have been done. Uh, after that, uh, first uh, important stages uh, preparing a model uh, and uh, behind the geological structures uh, and uh, the block model uh, has been achieved by. Uh, on, um, with uh, high accuracy. And uh, after that, uh, in order to do uh, statistical estimation, uh, we should use, uh, we should achieve a variogram plots. Variogram uh, is uh, a 
a very important tool uh, is considered as an important uh, tool and uh, means to uh, achieve geostatistical parameters. For, uh, for uh, example, effective range, uh, which is used to um, uh, calculate the effective range uh, which each uh, sample uh, could be effective by the uh, other sample. Uh, so after uh, achieving all these parameters for all uh, three variables, uh, I want to briefly explain about sequential Gaussian simulation. Uh, first, um, transformation of original data into uh, normal ones um, should be done, and uh, data, so uh, data mine software uh, applies this, uh, can apply this transformation automatically. After, after that, um, assigning transformed data into a, a simulation grid. Uh, and uh, selecting a random pass uh, uh, should be introduced. Uh, and uh, when a node in the random pass uh, is visited, uh, ordinary cruising uh, would be used to estimate a uh, mean and standard and estimate that on a known uh, sample. Uh, and uh, after comp uh, completing this uh, procedure, uh, finally back transform the realizations to the original space will occur. Uh, by considering different passes, we can uh, have a, a wide variety of possible realizations of the resource. So. Uh, uh, <coughs> Mm, uh, uh, SGS uh, objective uh, is um, uh, estimating each unknown uh, sample uh, with the highest uh, similarity with actual data. So it, uh, it can lead uh, our uh, results uh, to have the least uh, smoothing effect. Uh, after that, in order to validate our results uh, uh, according to uh, my uh, words, uh, all uh, histograms and uh, virogram uh, for all realizations should uh, overlap. And uh, all validation for a three variable uh, was very uh, successful. And after that, uh, we should uh, select the best uh, realization uh, uh, among uh, 100 realizations that we uh, have done and uh, you can uh, have a, a great observation of the resource for each variable so uh, it can uh, make a big contribution uh, to the industry, for instance, making uh, uh, appropriate classification and uh, uh, consequently setting a, a stringent plan uh, with, uh, uh, which is optimal and uh, cost effective would be possible. Uh, in detailed exploration, uh, uh, after drilling and acquiring a reliable data based on before uh, considerations in initial at the initial stages of uh, mining, uh, this method helps to change uh, a limited number of data uh, into a large amount of information without dissipating a large amount of money, time, and energy. Uh, and uh, considering the high costs of uh, analyzing with ICBMs and the other ones. Uh, finally, it's not forcey to say that um, according to the SGS uh, uh, objective, uh, achieving extreme values um, is one of the most uh, uh, important accomplished uh, by this method. Thank you for your attention. Is there any question? No question. Thank you. Um, I would like to invite Professor Ahmadi, who is giving an interview.